Hello and welcome to the Geeks Review. I'm Royce. I'm Joshua. I'm Matt. And I'm Aaron. Uh, welcome back to the show, Josh and Matt, and welcome to the show, Aaron. Before we get started, Josh and I have extensively discussed films we like on the show. Uh, and last time you were here, Matt, we discussed some films which weren't so fantastic, despite mm-hmm. the name. <laughs> uh, but do you used to want to sort of introduce yourselves again and uh, talk about some films that you do like? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm Matt. Um, I am a, a musician and an actor, so I love musicals. Um, but generally, like generally, they don't really translate from stage to screen. There's very few successful movie musicals in in my opinion but other than like movie musicals i i really i just really love you know i i love science fiction i love my star trek and star wars and i love my doctor who but i was also keen for a bit of a rom-com every now and then um big fan of love actually um yeah look i i i love most films so it's very hard for me to hate films i normally just get sad when they don't live up to their potential uh, yes i'm aaron and i'm also an actor into musicals, things like that. Uh, I love film. I'm studying screen and media. So I've had the chance to look at amazing films and bad ones. Um, I grew up watching things like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, um, but I focus more on the fantasy side of things and sci-fi. I love comic book movies. So I'm kind of in a very broad range. I've even loved dramas. You know, watch some Tarantino any day or um, Martin Scorsese, always open for a lot of those sorts of things. On today's show, we'll be turning back towards a bit of a negativity to discuss movies we did not like. These might not necessarily be bad movies, some of them might even be considered to be good, but these are just films that disappointed, disgusted, or even angered us. <laughs> disgusted. <laughs> yes, disgusted. Yeah, those, those are words. Those are, those are words. So who wants to get us started? Matt? Do you want to launch into your least favourite movie? Oh, okay. Okay, then. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, 2017's uh, The Greatest Showman, starring Hugh Jackman. Um, As I said in my spiel, I love musicals, and I really want to love most musical movies, but often they just don't translate. Greatest Showman is unique because it's completely original. It's not based on a stage show. Mm. Uh, It's based... Very loosely on the life of P.T. Barnum, the inventor of what we now know as the circus, um, I- ignoring all of the terrible things he did <laughs> to create this very bland, sanitary, ideal hero in mm. that Hugh Jackman can play. Um, and the reason I hate it so much is because the music is fantastic. The performances are fantastic. The visuals, in my opinion at least, are fantastic. The only thing that suffers is the script. Mm -hmm. The script is the biggest problem and it tears everything else down. And the reason it suffers is, well, it could... There are issues with the fact that P.T. Barnum was a terrible person and they make him, you know, they make him Hugh Jackman for the movie. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk oh, we'll about ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not talking about that. That is a problem for another discussion, mm-hmm. but um I hate the fact that none of the characters actually make sense. The songs don't need to be there and no big emotional moments actually change the show, change the progression of the narrative. There's no way. No, there isn't, exactly. Mm-hmm. The rule about writing a musical is when you it's all to do with emotion, so When the emotion builds up so much that you can't express it by talking, you sing. And when the emotion is so high that you can't express it with singing, you dance. And the songs always need to change something. So if it's a solo, the character has to make a decision. The character Over the course of the song, the character has to realize something and something needs to change. If it's a duet, say a love duet, two characters who had not kissed should kiss and then they're together if it's a song about accepting yourself you should sing about how you've been downtrodden all your life and now you're accepting yourself and then you don't take anyone's can i say the s word if you want yeah it (laughs) um afterwards none of the songs in the film make a difference for example it's like a glorified soundtrack it is it is yeah and the soundtrack is fire Mm. The music is fantastic. Like it's 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 sappy pop garbage, but 
we all love sappy pop garbage here and there. Yeah. I'm not talking. <laughs> to you. I'm not talking to you, Josh. So, for example, um, song that upsets me perhaps the most is uh, the bearded lady song. Uh, this is me. This yes. is me. That one. So it comes at a point in the movie where P.T. Barnum's freaks, you know, the bearded lady, the the conjoined twins who don't speak for some reason, and the beautiful woman who is a trapeze artist who just happens to be black, therefore she's a freak. Oh, dear. Um, they're all trying to get into this big party that P.T. Barnum's got into because of his circus, and they're like, hey, we deserve to be here. Um, and he goes, uh, no, you're going to embarrass me, and shuts the door on them. Terrible thing, but, you know, terrible thing to it's do. It's Hugh Jackman, boys. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and Okay, I'll get on to Barnum later. Yeah, he shuts the doors on them, and they're all like, oh, no. Oh, very sad. And then Kiala Settle, who's playing the bearded lady, starts singing this Basler song. It's like, I've learned to love the dark. Hide away, they say. No one want your broken parts. And it's an amazing song. It starts soft, and then all the freaks come in. It's, and then it's a big pop triumphant thing, and they burst out into the street and declare how proud they are to be themselves rather than burst into the party they've been shut out of and actually achieve something. They just go outside into the street. And then, to finish the song, they just perform at Barnum Circus. So they haven't shown him anything. Mm. And then after the song, they're not like striking against him. They still love him. They still work at his circus. They just let him shut the door on them, say, hey, you know what? I love myself. I don't care what anyone else thinks. And then they just keep doing what they were doing before. And it's really sad. Also, not every song can be a showstopper. Otherwise, the show never moves. <laughs> and every song is huge. Every song gets enormous. And here and there in a musical, it's okay to have lots of big, high, poppy numbers. That's fantastic. But you need a quiet number here and there. But even the quiet numbers build up to a huge crescendo. Mm. And it's really sad. The lesson that Barnum is supposed to learn is very muddy mm. like he starts the film like you start the film you see him as a child he's a poor shoe shiner who's in love with the rich girl or is he a tailor's son he's a tailor's son yeah. um <laughs> i think that's the uh, the problem the film something, something with shoes yeah uh the <laughs> tailor the tailor's working on a dress for this you know rich girl and this scruffy tailor's son is trying to flirt with her and the father kicks him out and then his father spoilers by the way his father dies and you know he is shown he's on the street and he's only shown kindness by a woman with a facial deformity who never comes back yes. she like there's this big iconic shot of her giving him an apple and that like never comes back he never mentions later in the film i need a place for these downtrodden people to be themselves and be proud of themselves he just sees it as a way to make money um because <laughs> yep. yeah he's he, he grows up and eventually somehow it's actually not clear how somehow he gets money and um yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> he makes a metamorphosis from this 10 year old kid into 50 year old hugh jackman <laughs> playing 25 um and he he, he goes and to michelle williams who's the rich girl he goes her to her place and goes like hey father i'm gonna marry your daughter and then they're like poor and he's working for a shipping company but they lose all their ships so he loses his job and so he invests money he doesn't have to start the circus and he just treats everyone like garbage and he's just always in it for the money and then like right at the end he suddenly like has this epiphany when like the circus burns down he's sad because like the circus burns down and he's in the bar and all these um, freaks who should be angry at him because you know he treated them like garbage and he used them for his show he made money off of them doing stuff and then now their livelihood's completely gone and they all file into the bar and he's like sad and i was watching it going like yeah they should probably kick him down now because he's really screwed them over but they're like hey are you okay and then he starts singing this song like it re reminds me what all it was for it led me back to you and he's saying he did the circus for the freaks when no he absolutely didn't and then and then when the song builds up because again every song has to be a every song has to be a showstopper he's like oh i've got to go find my family and tell them oh yeah his, his wife starts to leave him he's like oh gotta go tell my family i love them and 
I'm going to admit I cried watching the movie, but that's just because the music was so good. Yeah. And I felt the emotion all from the music and none of it was from the story. And the freaks are like, yay, we helped our abusive boss who and we've <laughs> lost all of our money forever. And he's gone to go tell his wife he loves her and let's just dance in the bar and, and riff. And it sucks. There's one song in the show, in the musical, in the movie that actually works. And it's the song between Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron when Hugh Jackman's trying to convince Zac Efron to co-fund the circus because it's a fun little slapstick dance number where they're arguing about the merits of co-funding the circus. Actually got to do with the story. Yes, and then at yeah. the end of the song, they're co-funding the circus. So a decision has been made. But then the other song Zac Efron is in is the love song with Zendaya, the uh, beautiful black trapeze artist. And society doesn't want them to be together because it's, you know, the early 20th century and she's black and like, okay, cool, that's that makes sense. And after he tries to take her to the opera, his parents see her and she's like, oh, disgusting. And so she runs away. And then he runs and follows her. And um, they sing this beautiful song called Rewrite the Stars. And it's all talking about, oh, if only we could change the world so we could be together. And the song is building and they're both doing trapeze stuff. And it's all beautiful and stunning. And then at the end, the last line of the song is, we're bound to break and my hands are tied. And it's like, why did you just do this big, beautiful number if you're not going to decide to be together despite everyone's prejudices? Make a decision when you do a big song. And then just at the end, they're just together. You know, there's no real yeah, resolution or conflict to any of that. Because he saves her from a fire. Ah. <laughs> That's the thing. I That's mean, right. I've seen this film and the plot I do not remember <laughs> at all <laughs> I but i remember, remember liking watching it. it you said it is the songs it's the visuals and, and that's all fantastic yeah oh when but... you watch it in a cinema it's mind-blowing yeah you've got like the surround sound system oh yeah and you get that first moment when it's like oh boom <laughs> and it's like holy shit. <laughs> you know and then you're like oh this is going to be a good movie and you have you're on that high for like the whole movie until you realize oh this way, this just stayed up here the whole time. Yeah, it doesn't Went have a lot nowhere. of doesn't have a lot of rewatch value. Yeah, exactly. It's great the first time. It's like Avatar, the James, the James Cameron, Cameron movie. Oh yeah, the mm. blue monkeys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's almost like you should just cut out the connective tissue between the songs and then just have like the the music clips. Well, that's why something. I bought the album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah. I mean, this is a movie though, but you got that visual component to it, which yeah. like I said it it enhances it. But yeah, I mean, P.T. Barnum is a fascinating character who could have done with like an amazing film. I mean, you he's know, got a musical. There's a musical called Barnum. Oh, that's even is worse. Though, which is like, yeah, oh. probably, should, but at least maybe the mu- the songs, I haven't heard them. They're, they're all like, you know, classic Broadway mixed with big top. Ah, uh, yep. All right. Mm. <laughs> okay, we'll just forget this about is, that then. Yeah, this is a film where people come away from, like, especially me, thinking, oh, P.T. Barnum, he was all right. And then you look him up and he's like, wow, he's a, he was a horrible man. Yeah, one well, thing I read about P.T. Barnum doing was he had, she wasn't a slave, but, you know, she was black and so she needed to work for him. And yeah. she was, you know, she had a hard life. She was like 50 when she died. She was very wrinkly and, you know, mm. beaten. And then he let people pay to come see her corpse and said that she was the maid of Abraham Lincoln and said she was 112. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the kind of stuff he did. I know the story of the Cardiff Giant where he basically ripped off this this well, this guy and it was like um, a, a guy hoaxed someone by making this giant sculpture and he dug it up and claimed it was like the uh, the fossilised remains of a real giant person and then... P.T. Barnum stole it. And then... Uh, well, everyone sucks here. Yeah, everyone sucks. <laughs> yeah. Great on visuals, great on music, but just the, the connected tissue. Exactly. And that's the thing. Don't make a movie unless you're absolutely sure of the story you want to tell. Mm. Um, this was a passion project for Hugh Jackman, wasn't it? Well, um, I wouldn't say it was a passion project, but he did keep trying to get it to happen. Mm. I'm not sure why. Why did he just want to <laughs> play P.T. Barnum? And like not even honestly. Yeah, it could have been... He could have just created an alternate world where some other dude created the circus. And, and that it had pro- to be Barnum. But you've also got to realise the... Um, I'm pretty sure the estate of P.T. Barnum's still around. Oh, yeah, the museum. Yeah, you know, so a museum they for probably stuff. would be leaning on that. Much like how the... Um, hmm. The household of um, the Wright brothers lean on the Smithsonian 
museum in America basically saying, we, we only allow you to have the right flyer on display so long as you tell people that the Wright brothers actually were the first and only people to do manned flight. So well, they weren't. They weren't. Oh, there were they plenty weren't. of people during that time period who actually did self-propelled flight, motorized. Wow. So it's essentially Barnum's family is kind of breathing down Hugh Jackman's neck. Yeah, better we'll not, be breathing down the studios. Better neck. not sully the the mm. name of our ancestor. It's a similar <laughs> problem that Bohemian Rhapsody suffers as oh, well. Yeah. To then say that Wild. like Freddie Mercury was the only party animal in the band. Yeah, <laughs> and like, also come on, Brian, you know, Brian, Brian may. Yeah, got, Brian and Roger were producers on the film. Yeah. And they're angels in the movie. <laughs> well, that explains a lot. I mean, what are they going to do? A bloody um, a Rolling Stones oh, God. bio one and suddenly, you know, <laughs> Keith Richards Sabbath is a saint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I have a hot take that I actually really like about the film. There's a bit where uh, Jenny Lind, who was a real person that Barnum worked with, real story, you know, she was a classical soprano um and in the film she gets up and sings like a demi lovato slash adele kind of huge pop ballad Mm -hmm. um and lots of people i know are like oh this is ridiculous she should be singing classical soprano but it's a representation Mm -hmm. so audiences in the early 20th century listening to her singing classical soprano would be like us listening to you know, someone with a huge belting voice like that now. And Mm. I thought that was a really clever device and I really liked that. Um, But my final thoughts are I'm going to watch this movie a lot before I die (laughs) and just think about what it could have been because I love everything except the script. I have many guilty pleasures of bad films. The Highlander, Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat various other films and when I was roughly about 1920 when I found out that there was a Mortal Kombat film I have been a huge fan of the games for a very long time it's just something so cathartic (laughs) 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 to just you know play the dude and rip out a guy's heart or, you know, rip out their spine, freeze them and beat them to death. <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna... <laughs> <laughs> you okay, Josh? Do we need to leave the room? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a moment, I'm good. And to find out, you know, that they made a film. And MK1, when I watched it, I knew it was bad. And <laughs> <laughs> it had a charm to it. Everyone gave it it. They're all... I forget the actor who played Shang Tsung, but he's my favorite favorite one out of all of them so much so that never realm when they did mortal kombat 11 and brought back shang Tsung as a play as a new unlockable character said hey can we get the old mortal kombat movie actor to mocap shang Tsung's face and do all his lines that's awesome <laughs> and it, it, they finished the shang Tsung reveal trailer with your soul is mine <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same facial expression, just a little bit chubbier. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole of Mortal Kombat 11 is just a love letter to this old film. Mm. Like, there are references to it. Like, uh, you can get an item for Johnny Cage that is $500 sunglasses. Those are $500 sunglasses, <laughs> asshole. And I, ah, it, it, great film, charming. Not to mention, you have... Christopher Lambert, the Highlander himself, as Lord Raiden. Honestly, one of the two best parts of the film. Isn't Raiden supposed to be Asian? <laughs> we don't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> You've seen what he looks like in, in the new Mortal Kombat games. He is white as hell. He is white. And if you um, look at it, Christopher Lambert is a Frenchman who played a Scotsman in oh Highlander. While, while a Scotsman played, played an Egyptian. Played a Spaniard. Played a Spaniard who was Egyptian who spent time in Japan. But yes, <laughs> semantics. And then I found out there's a second film. Like, okay, is it going to be just as bad but good? Oh, I was wrong. I was dead wrong. Oh, this film, like Greatest Showman, had the potential. Mortal Kombat 2 and 3 roster was just amazing. Smoke, Cyrax, Sub-Zero... Sector, Jax, Mataro, Lady Shiva, and Sindel. Ah, oh, the classics. 
And then they couldn't even get some of the original actors back for the goddamn film. Mm. They've lost Christopher Lambert as Raiden. Now they've got bloody James Radar. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Where's Lambert? <laughs> You've got no original actress for Sonya Blade. I can't even remember the actress's name. I just know she's the chick from bloody one of the Adam Sandler films. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it was Billy Madison. Oh, dear. <laughs> I want to touch the Heine. Uh, the effects are bad, even by... But it's good Wait, Is that the one where a Liu Kang transforms into the dragon? Yes. It's the one... Oh, because, that's terrible. Because Mortal Kombat <laughs> 2 brought in a special fatality called Animality. Where Liu Kang would turn into a Chinese long, not a Western dragon, and eat his opponent. Mm-hmm. And Nightwolf would turn into a wolf, but you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, describe Ameri- this effect for the viewers at home and for me so, who's never seen this film. <laughs> think of the beautiful Harryhausen plasticine in scenes from you know like the odyssey and all that the old stop motion stuff now imagine that put into a blender fed to a dog and then shat out onto a computer generated system and then you have the effects of mortal Kombat annihilation you have this plasticine cgi abomination of a western dragon and a hydra as a not first climactic battle but second mid before the final <laughs> battle. I, right. I, I saw a CGI like breakdown of that and like his mouth starts transforming like the dragon's mouth starts yeah. transforming on his neck. Mm-hmm. It looks atrocious. It is atrocious. The only two good effects in the entire film is Shiva, who is just a chick where they've got an extra prosthetic arms and stuck him there and you know, wire. That, really? Yeah. This Indian chick put her in a red mankini, strapped on a set of fake arms, and strung them together so they would move. So her bottom arms move the same way as her top arms. Yes, because she's a Takadan and they've got four sets of arms. <laughs> but Can you they see the wires. No. Oh. Thank God for that. That's why I said it was a good effect. Oh, okay. okay. As compared to Goro in the first film, yeah. which is beautiful She's even like by today's standard it's a puppet he's actually there and then you've got motaro who is this weird human ram centaur with a scorpion tail looking guy and the effects are good they hold up until he starts fighting mm. and then it's just okay that's um <laughs> what was you thinking new line cinema for 1997 this was okay it was yeah, but... I you, don't think it was good even then, to be You honest. <laughs> open up with the Mortal Kombat theme, you have it for the climax, and you're meant to deliver. You massacred Johnny Cage in the first. Mind you, that's an actor's choice. He looked at the script and went, I'm out. You know, you've got the film, and the opening line for the bad guys is, The Earth was created in six days, and I shall destroy it in the same! <laughs> 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 and on the seventh... Shall Khan shall rest and look upon what he has done, and it will be glorious! Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, Shao, the guy who's playing Shao Khan, Brian Thompson, he's having a ball. I am so glad about this, dude. I'm just ashamed about the CGI Hydra. It's like <laughs> yeah. you can't you can't say, you know, Raul Julia was bad in Street Fighter. I he was doing such a good him job. as Bison. It's just <laughs> a shame that was his last film. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Put that a little depression cap in you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and we all remember the line. <laughs> the, the emergence of Sindel, probably one of the most badass characters in the games. <sighs> Mother, you're alive. Too bad you will die. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Sets the tone. Then you have a nice little fight scene with Liu Kang versus S- Smoke. And again, look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> <laughs> then they throw in Sub-Zero for a little bit. And there he goes. Nice seeing you. What are you doing here, Kwai Liang? Don't know. Good to see you. Play the game. Scorpion, you're here too. And nice choreography. I'm going to give mm. the movie this. The fight choreography, not bad. Maybe just a little bit above Power Rangers level in some places, <laughs> but not bad. <laughs> I mean, how are you going to try and, you know, turn serious, do a black dude with cyber arms beating up a yellow robot? For me, should have been 
It had potential. But they tried to cram too much in. They had too large of a roster. And they massacred my favorite characters. I'm just so glad Kano died in the first film. Otherwise, mm. I would have had to go back in time and shoot the director. <laughs> <laughs> and Kano himself has become a meme in the series. I mean, he started off as this chav and now he's an Aussie. Yeah, yeah he's an Aussie. He's an oh. Aussie now. I guess I'm just too busy button mashing yeah. to really pay attention. I mean, attention. They, they added in a friendship where he's literally cooking a snag on a barbie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, that's the level of creativity. Never on goes. It's just a shame the films don't get this. I mean, Ni- Annihilation, I believe, sets the precedent for bad video game films. So much so that Mortal Kombat as a film, a reboot, or a continuation has been in development hell since 1997. Yeah, and they're only finally only just released recently, the new cast list. But actually, recently holding um, some casting calls for martial artists in Australia, which I tried to convince uh, my friend Robbie and a few other people that I he, to go for it. He applied. He applied for he it, did, so that's yeah. good. They said, don't call us, we'll call you. Oh, uh, <laughs> do you think and there are any good video game movies, Josh? Yes. Oh, that was a little bit of a long thought. <laughs> Tomb Raider. Which one? First one. Oh, yes. With um, Angelina Jolie. Yes. I think they're all pretty good in their own way. Um, hang on, I've got more. They're I love... Street Fighter. I love Super Mario Brothers. The one with Bob Hoskins. Unironically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, th- I love Fighter, it. Street Fighter, the original Mortal Kombat film. The Street Fighter's the one with Kylie Minogue, isn't it? Yes. Yep. When John Claude Van Damme, who was really high on coke, managed to nail. I love the low point of his career. But why would you get John Claude Van Damme to be an American? Guile. You got a Belgian man to play an American. Why? I'll tell you why, Aaron. You've lost your boss. (laughs) (laughs) No one else could deliver it like that. True. True. No. You've lost your boss. <laughs> and not to mention my favorite line of the, the entire film. It is okay because we can go home. The war is over. And remember, we tried so hard. <laughs> yeah. That is why you get a Belgian to play an American. I would not wish this upon my most mortal of enemies. This film is one of those films that you will find in the nine circles of hell. <laughs> It is a sin to video game films, even to bad video game films. And I'm talking about Resident Evil here. <laughs> oh, dear. And Bloodborne. Oh, God. And any of the Uta Ball films. <laughs> Honestly, Mortal Kombat. Annihilation set a lot of shit thrown at it. I just want to add my turd to the pile. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's episode. We'll be back next week to discuss the rest of our films, starting with Aaron's, as well as my own least favorite movies. I'm Royce. I'm Joshua. I'm Matt. And I'm Aaron. And we'll see you next week. Bye for now.